Welcome to this week's message from Burwood United Methodist Church. I'm Tim Wood, the Supply Pastor. Today's message will be from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. This is the story of the unusual healing of the great military commander Naaman. Our scripture reading, 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him, of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and all your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleaned? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, Wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean, like that of a young boy. This ends the reading of the scripture. As I have said many times from the pulpit, God's ways are 180 degrees opposite of the world's ways. The story of Naaman is another example of this truth. The great warrior Naaman is humbled and saved by the least of society, a servant girl and the servants who accompanied him to the home of the prophet Elisha. The story of Naaman was mentioned by Jesus when he preached in his hometown synagogue. Jesus said, There were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, but God healed none of them, only Naaman the Syrian, and they very nearly killed him for saying so. I would like to tell the story of Naaman in the first person, that is, I'm going to speak in the voice of Naaman. My name is General Naaman. I should be the envy of everyone in the nation of Syria. I am a great warrior. I am tall. I am handsome. I am strong. I have led the armies of Syria to many victories. I led the warriors of Syria against Israel and returned triumphant. Although a funny thing about that battle, it it seemed almost as if we were receiving divine help. It was too easy. I am a great man because I have done great things. Because of my great accomplishments and my powerful appearance, I should be enjoying the pleasures that I have earned. But it isn't a wound suffered in battle that hinders me. I am the victim of a skin disease. Much of my skin has changed from the dark tan color to a pathetic white. People who once looked at me with respect now look down or away when they speak with me. That is, if they're not avoiding me altogether. I am ritually impure because of this disease. None of the healers in Aram can help me. Am I to live the rest of my life this way? Is there no hope for me? Well, in one of those raids on Israel, we captured a young girl who became the servant to my wife. She told my wife there is a prophet in Israel who can cure me. A prophet? 
in Israel? Really? I don't believe in Israel's God. I haven't believed in much of anything except myself, my own power. But I was desperate. I decided to visit the prophet in Israel. Nothing had cured me. What did I have to lose? Now, going to Israel, a nation I had defeated in battle, had some political implications. We were at peace with Israel after our army defeated them, but it was a fragile peace and we had to be careful. My king sent a letter explaining what I desired. I wasn't sure if there would be a price for my healing. I loaded up with gold, clothing, and other riches. I was ready to give up a fortune to be healed. The visit to the king of Israel did not go well. Either my king didn't understand what I was asking for, or the king of Israel didn't understand the letter. The Israelite king thought he, not a prophet, was being asked to cure me. The king of Israel feared it was a pretext for war. He tore his clothing, which was a sign of sorrow. Word of the king's actions spread throughout the country and very quickly. It wasn't long until the king received word from someone named Elisha. He said he was a prophet. Was he the prophet in Israel that the servant girl had spoken of? Elisha told the king to send me to see him. Perhaps I was getting close to a cure. I expected that the prophet would live in a large house with much splendor, but instead I was taken to a simple house. Still, I believed the prophet could heal me. I was loaded with treasure. I brought gold, silver, and suits of clothing. But the prophet wouldn't even come out and talk to me. I expected him to come out, raise his hands, and call on the power of his God to heal me. But no, I was, I was to wash seven times in the Jordan River if I wanted to be healed. Was this some kind of joke? All I had to do was a simple act of immersing myself in the ugly stream. There are much better rivers than Aram. Why did I have to submit to this? Was a prophet messing with my mind? I decided I wanted no part of this. Skin disease or not, I deserve more respect than what the prophet showed me. I gave the order to pack up and head back home. One of the servants wanted to talk to me. Now, I treat my servants well. They like me. I was willing to hear what he had to say. The servant asked me if I would be willing to do something more difficult to receive healing than what the prophet told me to do. Now, I am a self-made man. I worked and fought hard to become a military general. Nobody gave me any special help. I became a great man by doing great things. I felt humiliated by the prophet's request, yet the servant was right. If healing required me to do something great, I would have done it. Great things are what I do. What did I have to lose? So I went down to that so-called Jordan River and did what the prophet told me to do. And it worked! In fact, my skin was like that of a young boy. How could such a simple act bring a miraculous healing? I returned to the prophet's house. This time he came out and talked to me. He turned down my gifts. This act of healing had convinced me that there is only the one true Lord. I confessed that to the prophet. I have to admit now that maybe I'm not the self-made man I thought I was. Perhaps I didn't appreciate the help I received over the years. It was revealed to me that my victory over Israel was made possible by their God. I can't claim the credit for it, and the healing came from their God. I know that it is folly to give myself so much credit. The glory goes to the one true God. I now know the value of humility. And so ends the narrative of Naaman. Faith is a crumpling of pride. The church is the only organization I know of that has this admission standard. Admit that you have fallen short of God's standard. Ask for forgiveness. Put away the bad kind of pride and rinse and repeat. Over the years, I've learned that when I start to believe I'm really great, that's when I usually get humbled in some way. Oh, I've done some impressive things in life, at least things that were impressive to me. You may have done something impressive at your job, perhaps, and all the boss does is mumble, good job, and go on his or her way. God is part of my humbling process. God does not do it to hurt me, but to make me a better follower. Years ago, I watched a few episodes of a television show called Undercover Boss. In these shows, the head of a company disguised himself, himself or herself, and went to work for the company anonymously in a low-level job. On every episode I remember, the big boss would struggle with the job and take orders from a low-level supervisor who often was not kind. The big boss was humbled and gained a new appreciation of the jobs of the low-level workers. 
Some of the wisest people I've ever met did not have a title or a degree or anything to indicate they were smart or wise. One of the smartest people I've ever known is the owner of a used guitar shop in Springfield, Missouri, not far from where I grew up. Somehow he built a collection of guitars that was worth millions. I've stayed in contact with him for more than 40 years. He still runs his used guitar shop. He's still very humble and down to earth. When I was a journalist, I had the opportunity to interview a number of people who did have important titles. When I was working as a journalist in Texas, I did a one-on-one -on -one interview with George W. Bush, who, at the time, had not yet gotten into politics. I had several interactions with him over the years. Politics aside, he was one of the nicest people I've ever met. He even offered me his pen when my pen stopped writing during a news conference. I have interacted with a number of well-known people over the years. Almost always the ones who had achieved the most appeared to be the most humble. God helps us achieve humility by loving us just as we are. When you have God's peace, you don't need to brag about yourself. You don't need the false sense of security that relies on your accomplishments or status. The Bible tells us no more about Naaman except for when Jesus mentioned the story of Naaman when Jesus preached in his hometown of Nazareth. I would like to think that Naaman continued to be successful because of his newfound humility. He learned that the victory in the war with Israel was because God aided him. God did this to teach the Israelites a lesson. I'd also like to think that Naaman told the people of Syria about the prophet who had healed him through the power of the Almighty, One True God. And so, here again is the Bible being 180 degrees opposite to the world view. The path to true greatness is lined with humility. Amen.